Today I'm going to be looking at NASs and power consumption and kind of optimizing that. So one thing for especially home users, our power consumption can be a pretty big issue, especially with these older systems that a lot of people like to use, including me. I have a lot of older dual Xeon systems, and while they're great, they're cheap, they are very high performance, they're generally well supported for a lot of commercial software like VMware and Windows Server, and they're pretty darn stable systems too, they're power hungry. And they can, even older stuff, some of that older stuff idles at 200 or more watts, and it can get even more under load. So I'm going to take a look at trying to optimize power consumption, looking at a few different systems, and kind of looking at a what can be done, what works, what doesn't make sense, and kind of how that all plays out. So today's application is going to be kind of a simple NAS. I'm going to be just be using FreeNAS as the OS, because I want an excuse to play with that a bit. And we're going to be looking at some hardware. So this system here is kind of a older NAS I built up for something, and it's going to get torn down now. So looking in it right now, it has a dual Xeon um, 1366 system. So these are nice chips. It's relatively nice older super micro board, but it isn't that power efficient. So looking at this board, you can see that it has four memory DIMMs in it. It has dual quad core chips has a lot of extra stuff on these heat sinks. I think it has, like it has a full chip that and a separate south bridge. All of that uses power. It has six drives in it, a few fans. Like all of those are sitting and using power consumption. While as some of the more lower power consumption boards I'm gonna be looking at are these guys. So this is an AMD FX system. FX was never known for power consumption, but compared to Dual Xeon, it looks reasonably good. But this doesn't have a lot of good things going for it. So this is a higher end board. And when you get higher end boards, you start to get things like extra SATA controllers, extra slots, each one of those, high end audio, that has more components, bigger VRMs, which are good for high power CPUs, but end up being slightly less efficient for very low power chips. Um, you end up getting things like more memory slots, or you use more memory often. Extra USB 3 controllers, all of those use a little bit of power, and while a lot of it can be turned off and it might be less than a watt each, it adds up. The other kind of low power system I have to look at is this guy. So this is an ASUS Q87 board, it's designed for business desktops. Compared to that, it has a very wimple power stage, it looks like maybe even like a little three phase system. It has just a um, Northbridge or I, yeah, whatever Intel calls their chipsets now. It doesn't have a separate North Bridge and South Bridge like these other systems do, so that saves a little bit of power. You can tell there's no big heat sinks on it, so it's not even expecting to use that much power. There's a lot less to little chips, so it doesn't have any extra SATA controllers. USB 3, this is a bit newer, but USB 3 is built into the chipset, so it doesn't need a separate little chip that uses maybe half a watt to do that. And there's just less features that use power on it. So I'm going to kind of be going through power consumption. Another thing on servers that uses a reasonable amount of power, especially with high-end ones with big fans, is fans can use quite a bit. A normal little desktop fan like this might use a watt, but some of these big high-power fans you find in servers, sometimes they use like 10, 20 watts, and if you have five of them, that's a lot of power. CPU-wise, I have a Intel Pentium Dual Core. Not a very fast chip, but it should be sufficient for a gigabit. We'll take a look at that in a little bit, but it should really help to cut down on power consumption. Otherwise, in this system, I have five two terabyte Seagate video drives. They're designed for um, video recording, so like little TV boxes. They're actually quite low power and quiet drives and don't make much heat, so they're pretty good there. And a little one terabyte green drive from WD as a boot drive. Not the optimal drives to use in an ass, but I have them laying around and they're actually reasonably low power. And I think this is an 80 plus power supply, so it's reasonably efficient too. So I'm mostly gonna be looking at like board power consumption. So let's try to save a little bit of power now. So this has been kind of my default situation. I've already ran all the numbers for this. So we're gonna to try to save a little bit. First of all, we're gonna just try to do BIOS things. So changing things like how it does power saving states um, and just little things like that. So we're gonna go try turning off power savings, all the power saving settings, setting them to the maximum, lowering boost clocks, turning off things that you don't need on the mother. Unfortunately, this motherboard doesn't have too many options when it comes to power saving features, so I just kind of turned the clock speed, turned off things like turbo boost, turned off things like hyper threading. All of those can increase power consumption by a little bit, so it's all been turned off, and we'll see how much of that helps with power consumption now. I finished doing testing, which involved changing settings in the BIOS to attempt to change power, and the really quick result of that is it doesn't do much. I saved a couple of watts, like, so I went from like 101 to 100, I think. So that, yeah, didn't really do anything. So the next step is let's try to take parts out. So we're gonna take out memory. 
So going from four sticks to one stick of BDR3 um, ECC. And the other thing I'll do is I will um, take out one CPU. So I'm going to go from dual socket down to single socket to see how much power change. I've done the first motherboard swap to the 990FX system with the 8350. And power consumption wise, it's about the same, but I want a little bit more load. But I do have quite a bit of optimization to do in this system as well. So I have a older hung power hungry graphic card in it, four memory slots, and some other things that can be optimized, and a lot of bio settings I think can be changed as well. But the system to kind of be a representation of kind of like an older higher end desktop or gaming rig has a higher end graphics card which used quite a bit of power that was from a few years ago before they got a lot of the idle power consumption reduction going has kind of a reasonable amount of RAM but it's the older smaller dims so you have a lot of dim still has like the older chipsets have a separate north bridge and south bridge so it is kind of representative of that but we'll take a look at how much we can optimize out of that here is the final config with the Pentium G3220 it's a much lower power system. Um, I don't have to use the slots for anything because it has an integrated graphics card. Still has 40 or uh, 3 slots. And overall, it looks like in the testing, this is using significantly less power than the other system. Here's the spreadsheet with all the results. So the total of three different platforms with about three to four different tests for each of them. The first for every platform is my kind of default, which is basically everything in the BIOS is set to auto. So all the power saving stuff is on, but it's not too aggressive but it can still get full performance. That's kind of what I leave all my systems to by default. And then I do one with all the systems of turning on everything to full power saving. So I like cut down clock speed, make sure everything's turn off like unnecessary features like audio and extra SATA controllers, a lot of extra little things. I don't normally do this on my personal systems because power saving is not generally too much and you start losing out on functionality. Otherwise, I look at two power consumptions. Idle power, which is where the system is just running the OS with no files being copied. Kind of got an average of that. And then an active power, which was copying one file from one client system. Reasonable representation of a kind of home NAS environment. These configurations, I ran crystal disk mark and a file copy test. I made a little um, graph here, but there's not really too much to see. The file copy test seems to be a bit, I'd almost say random. Um, and there was no real result to it. And the crystal disk mark was essentially the same among all of these. Now it is varying very limited by gigabit networks and it's also hit by only a single client. So if you need more intensive um, performances, you probably want to test this yourself. But for basic NAS, even turning it down to a dual core Haswell chip with only at like one gigahertz, I did not see a major performance impact. Now let's take a look at a comparison of the power consumption numbers. You can look at the individual power numbers for idle and load for the configurations on screen, but I summed it up in a little graph here that shows annual power consumption cost. This is assuming 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which is the average in the US. So first of all, looking at the dual socket 1366 system, changing the bio settings to low power didn't do that much. We saved about a watt at idle, and we saved about four watts under load. There wasn't really too much to optimize in this board either. Um, next thing, going from four dims to one dim saved quite a bit of power. We saved about seven watts at idle and about six watts under load. So that's a reasonable power consumption, but that also comes at a pretty considerable cost of cutting down RAM capacity quite a bit. The next one we did was take out a CPU. That helped a lot. That was 20 watts at idle and about 35 watts at load. So if you don't need a dual socket system and you have one, take the second CPU out. It saves a lot of juice. Looking at the FX8350 system representative of kind of more of an older gaming PC, we saw about the same power at idle at 100 watts, but even higher load at 174. Taking out that older high power graphics card cut us down to about 68 watts at idle and 137. The older graphics cards are very power hungry, just even though it's doing nothing graphically. Going to taking out the rest of the dims, save like a watt at idle and five watts under load. So compared to the server system, the extra dims didn't really affect you that much. And the low power savings with the BIOS cut another couple watts, another four watts at idle and another 30 watts during load. I think a lot of this 30 watts is I really limited the max clock speed and the number of cores enabled. Going to the G3220 system provided a massive jump in idle power down to 45 watts. Now remember that is with six drives, so the system itself is using I think less than 20 for the actual CPU and memory. 
and with 63 watts at load. Cutting it down to one dim provided basically no difference at idle 10 load. Going changing BIOS power savings actually hurt my results at idle, which seemed odd, but seemed to be reproducible. But it had a significant power savings at active load. So what are the takeaways from this experiment? First of all, take out extra hardware you don't need. A lot of hardware in your system is going to sit and suck up power. So if you can take off that hardware or disable it in the BIOS, you can save a reasonable amount of power. Especially like older power hungry graphics cards or extra memory or CPUs. Now, it's nice to have that and might be useful for your file server, but a lot of the times, if you don't need it, take it out. Next thing, BIOS settings. Things like limiting max CPU power and stuff like that really only seem to help a lot during load at idle because C states almost turn the CPU off at idle anyways. But since BIOS settings are relatively easy to do and don't cost really anything other than a little bit of time, you might as well try it, especially if you have a watt meter and see how much power you can save doing that. But I think the most important thing this shows is that pick a low power platform in the first place. Generally, the bigger the platform, the more the dim slots, the more the core count, the bigger the socket, stuff like that, the more power it's going to use at idle and load. So if you want a low power home server, get like a desktop platform or maybe even one of the embedded systems. Don't get a dual socket system if power is a major concern. Another thing to consider power wise is that you pay for the hardware and then you also pay for the power. So if you're in an area where power is expensive, it might be cheaper to buy a new low end system than to get a used system and because you'll save power. This system here showed with the average power consumption of almost a $60 savings per year. So that could easily pay for itself, especially if you live in a place with expensive electricity. Thanks for watching this video on NAS power consumption and hope this helps you optimize your new build.